Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. Tonight we're in for an electric evening of poetry as we welcome six of the most radical poets from the contemporary British scene to the bookshop tonight. Headlining is Greta Bellamachina, here to launch Poemas 2015 to 2018, her latest collection published in bilingual English-Spanish edition by, excuse the pronunciation, Valparaiso Editions in Spain. And Greta is joined by a wonderful coterie of poets from New River Press, an imprint that Greta founded with Robert Montgomery, another of our guests tonight, and that has been described by Autre Magazine as one of the UK's edgiest and most exciting and as rewarding by the legendary Tom Stoppard. The New River Press poets reading for us tonight will be Niall McDivitt, Robert Montgomery, Sophie Naufol, uh, Brit and Brit Parks, each of whom will be given the introduction they deserve by your Master of Ceremonies tonight, New River poet and editor Hethcote Riven. So without further ado, please give it up for Greta, Niall, Robert, Sophie, Brit and Hethcote. Hello everyone. It's so amazing to be here. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm just so pleased. We got the coach here uh, last night. Niall and Julie here. They took the coach here this morning, and then they're getting the coach back to London later on. So they're really hardcore doing it for this event, which I think is amazing. Um, and Brits come all the way from America with, just for this event, which is a real thank you, Brit. That's really amazing. We've. Um, We've never met Brit before, but we've been in contact for a long time over email, and we took a line, actually slightly paraphrased a line from one of her poems, as the title of our book, When They Start to Love You as a Machine You Should Run. And um, it's a yearbook, an annual yearbook that we do every year. We've done two so far. We're doing another one this winter. So submit your poems to us for that. It's an open submission book. Um, and that's kind of you know, how, how we operate. We do events, we meet people. We've been going, Rob uh, Montgomery and Greta Bellamachina founded the press and did an event here before, actually for it in 2016. Uh, and then I came on uh, working with them as editor for a couple, for the last couple of years. And it's been amazing. It's to give so, so much energy for finding stuff that's visual, that's on the page, that's kind of rebellious, but... It's free thinking, but you'll you'll see, you'll get an idea from all of us collectively, the thing we go for tonight. Um, I'm just going to read, actually, first of all, I'll introduce you to them all in the order that we'll have. It's got me first. I'm Hethcote Riffin, writer and editor here. We've got Britt Parks, who's a writer and artist who's from America, who I spoke about before. Then we've got Nar McDevitt, who is a wonderful Irish poet and psychogeographer who does wonderful walks around London, tracing the sort of histories of where poets have lived and loved and had all the major experiences of their lives. Rambo and Verlaine and William Blake. He's got five William Blake walks coming up in a, in a row to coincide with a Tate Britain's exhibition. Um, Blake in East London, North London, West London, South London and Central. And they're, they're kind of obsessive, wandering lectures and they're really fantastic. So please come along if you're in London. And then we've got Robert Montgomery, who is a Scottish artist whose work you may know. He does wonderful, huge text art, fire poems that he builds out of wood and sets on fire, billboard poems and a range of neons. And then Greta Bellamachina, whose work we're publishing. We're publishing tonight a Spanish book in English in France. So it's a kind of very good thing for the time. But it's, uh, and her work is really amazing and kind of transcendental and mystical and romantic and really original and brilliant. So you're in for a treat with that. And then we'll finish with a bit of music from the excellent British Lebanese composer Sophie Naufel, who, um, who you'll hear writes haunting and brilliant stories. I'm going to read a couple of poems and then we'll go to Brit. This one is about a um, friend of mine who died five and a half years ago. It's a sort of eulogy to him. And I just met today a sort of figure that we both knew together who he met on the street, who lives, a lovely man from Guadeloupe, uh, who we've met. So it was, he was kind of, it felt right to read this. It's in here. And I think the only things you should know is I'm at a, I'm at a dub night, a kind of reggae dub night. Uh, he loved David Attenborough, he used to stay up all night watching his videos. Uh, he was a moody, moody man who I loved very much. Thinking of you, Jamie, in love with the furious drums of Carnival, our own punk racket in my living room. 
you might be uncomfortable here, prone to feeling out of place. Caught at the right time, you'd be all over it. You are a singular character. What to say? To remember is to take a view. There are thoughts we wouldn't have shared. Towards the end, I almost didn't know you. Now there's no flesh, just bones on a hill in Morgan Porth, facing the sea. The bass here hurts your throat. Your boyish obsessions, your old man play act, Attenborough till sunrise, nature's greatest cruelties, the cordyceps fungi, a parasite, gets in insect muscles, ants beat their head madly, with their mandibles possessed, they climb and climb, until the fruiting bodies of fungus sprout out, and spores blossom, it wipes out whole colonies. To my communism, you replied, I'm attracted to the darker side of human nature. On that we never argued. Your clothes were iconic, mockingly sophisticated, staring at yourself for hours in the mirror, terrified, pulling faces. Your whole life, a strange war against pretension. I struggle to remember how you danced in public, just us thrown round your kitchen. Richard Hell, James Chance, Noy Bowden. You loved Last Exit to Brooklyn, first novel by Seaman Hubert Selby Jr got TB in his 40s, had ribs removed and half a lung, spent the next um, and half a lung, the other collapsed, he couldn't work, spent time in bed addicted to morphine, he said, I know the alphabet, I can write, his stories were brutal, you saw yourself in them somehow, in my head you wrote a story inspired by his second novel The Room, in my head based on the so-called sex dungeon, dilapidated basement flat squatted near the elephant, where you dwelt miserable, half rushing or withdrawing, the walls closing in, everybody has left. Are you lonely or is it a peaceful gloom? So serious, you are almost spiritual. They growl sermons here. We all feel the temptation of corruption, such suffering in the world. We in a trance, an exultant purging, you're still gone. Last week I heard a vicar repeat, the price we pay for love is grief. Once, bored, you and I went to a scrap heap in Wilsdon, the materials of city life torn up into desolate trinkets and piled into mountains. We climbed, were cut by avalanches. At the peak, with that bloated bottle of white lightning, we celebrated fragmentation, then the stars and mists of suburban flatlands. Now, I lie exhausted, with eyes closed, and use every muscle in my body to summon you, discover new memories, and feel guided. You preferred instant coffee to real stuff. When I drink it, I imagine your mouth, gaze at the walls of village underground, Three stories tall, Gothic Victorian like your name, James Edward Cripps. Thank you. Um, and then a slightly less, um, you know, <laughs> morbid one there. Um, this is not autobiographical, it's, but it is based in a real place a pie shop that's been open since 1890 in Bermondsey. Down top of Bermondsey along Tower Bridge Road. Late for work, but need the old pie shop first. Ah, terror at remembering the joy he felt last night. The sickness of today just failing to outweigh some relatively new need for the afterglow of a sniff. Lif, lip quivering briskly, walking with crashing cymbals, firing in his mind. He felt keenly that soon his life would be ruined. He could see hurt loved ones becoming ones who didn't love, from wary to recall it, recoiling and finally letting their love dry up, a release, mournfully embrace of the freedom a life without him offered. A gaunt white woman with grey hair and goggly eyes and a beanie offered him a Jesus flyer and he scowled at her with a totally unnecessary hatred. It was not a genuine impulse. Arriving at the pie shop, there was a lunchtime queue. He was so late. Irresponsibly, he parked up behind some ugly suits. An older woman who worked there came out for a smoke break, coughing, wincing, croaking at no one in particular. My bones ache. Can't they see I've got no one to cover? That's why I'm here. We're so busy. He himself felt in a chrysalis state of shame, felt morbid, about to be stillborn into a new life of peace he'd never hoped for. 
prayers for lost worlds, no nostalgia, no belief in progress, paranoid glances and moments where the fragments of the city slip together and others where seams between old streets wither, my mind dims and old haunts rearrange themselves till I take the wrong bus three times as if on purpose and I miss so much and find regret confusing. In a state of shock I called her, my manic drinking friend, or put differently, I called on fear, fear of having offended, belief that this was the end of a withered old connection. Hey, um, what are you up to? Yeah, I just wanted to call because I was having dark thoughts and I, I wanted to check in and see if we were okay. I, oh, that's, that's such a relief. Um, I, uh, I don't know uh, what I was thinking, but I'm, I thought I was about to lose you. Oh, I'm glad, ridiculous, terrible prang over. The three women inside the pie shop, serving pie and mash, happy, dancing, moving with grace and confidence, under the stone ceiling, the marble tiles, and a sign, London's oldest pie and mash shop since 1892. It was January. The man at the front of the queue was asked, you're right, love, and said tenderly, my New Year's resolution that I made to myself is to come here for pie and mash at least twice a month. I was next and asked for a veggie pie and mash and what is liquor and I was offered some to try. You need to put the salt and pepper in the vinegar to get the full effect and she stirred it. Later I ate soy mince gobulets with some ancient modern tough soft pastry smothered in a fistful of industrial math mash and sat at the dark wood church pews that they had for seats and I ate and then spread my elbows out on the thin marble tables, feeling like a happy, poor Victorian, warm in winter. Thank you very much. And if you could put your hands together for Brit Parks. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> He's quite tall. Um, so I'm Britt Parks and I am from the States um, and I just wanted to say one brief word uh, particularly about uh, Greta. Um, so four years ago I just saw this uh, small piece in a magazine um, and it had one of her poems and it was talking about the press that she and Robert were starting and for me it was like the, you know, the world lit up because it seemed... Uh, they were bringing something that was existed and was uh, already happening, but kind of giving it this new like breath and life. So, um, and we've been working together ever since. So, um, the way that New River Press fits into my life is actually quite sacred and quite special. So, I just wanted to say that, and particularly to Greta. So um, I, as Heathcote mentioned, you will hear this line in this piece. Uh, it is called Crossed Exile. <clears throat> I resigned from the Revolutionary Foreign Legion Council as I ran out of words that were proper felt, proper held. When they start to belove you as a machine, some lang-worthy cog, you should run. Fold your uniform first, it will slow them down. Tonight, my darling guts fell into my heart. They lied when they said it was a muscle. There are heart cavities in 2,000-year-old Italian marble gods, and they just arrived, and they are screaming. And tonight, Claudel is tired, and tonight, Mona Hatoum will cage her in the safety of exile. Exile is safe as it is defined. And tonight, Claudel is tired. And tonight, Mona Hatoum will cage her in the safety of exile. Exile is safe as it is defined. You know you are outside. You know where the bottom crosses. This isn't beautiful. Beautiful was never universal. It was a word that sounded like it is, and this is helpful. Until you are in exile, until four miles is the same as 4,000 miles, and a damned God is beautiful as you recognize it and confuse it with a mirror. <laughs> and um, the second piece you will hear uh, is 
called Radical Breaking. You will hear several French figures and history throughout this. Um, so very apropos to this shrine. Um, Quadel is drinking the sulfur of Rodin, and no one has a head. No one let her out. They hid her marble scriptures until no one had a head left to lift. She was a nurse de Jeanne d'Arc. You can be a nurse in an ancient age when it is fit needed. They said the lesbians in Paris and the left bank were radical in 1920. Radical is a skateboard breaking. Radical is a puffer fish telling you he won. Women kissing in Natalie Barney's garden were a sullen trophy. She terrified the not faint at heart. She scolded them when their hearts got faint. This makes Lady Godiva seem like a tableau, stiff with only breath for proof of life. A filth crisis is ethereal. We overpay for a mouth failure. We give away our terror like free propaganda. A gamine leg binds her toes and the delicate ferocity of lambent wool. And James Joyce hates her tea party. <laughs> you could call modern love a milk bath. You could serve it in slummy jars. A standard is never an offer. It is what you hold in your cheek when your tongue is pressed so tightly. Your eyes wish tears were not salt. They are just the ocean streaming down your face, a reminder that you could never be wrong. And then I just want to read um, two short pieces from Smear. This is the second edition. Soon it's going to its third edition. Um, so it's quite special. Um, this is called uh, Squirming Black Lace. According to Freud, according to Anne Carson, we all need a prehistory and we just repeat it. If you stretch like a thirsty camel into black lace, it feels familiar, sometimes as a tired word, but there is not yet a new one for it in this old English. Sometimes familiar is a slow death, sometimes familiar is a slow life. I left them hanging like a mausoleum, as solemn is contained within. I used to scrap lily limbs into those cutouts. They traversed the world and they really did. They gained holes traipsing through mud farms and woods with air you couldn't believe. The trees didn't believe it because it was borrowed. They tore their hand lines on chickens' houses. I am terrified of chickens. That explains the holes a little in a coarse bother of a way. I stood there huffing in my prehistory with the remote longing of him. Scattered as dust in a desert, I will perpetually wonder why the desert. I thought he would desire to ember into a mountainside. Mm. Sorry. Mm. I thought he would desire to ember into a mountainside. Was it dry and cruel? Was it infinite and thoughtful? I believed in neither. I think we underestimate the ways they chose to be born. In a thigh, in a storm, in half, they sinned and then they were sewn back in. They made all the rules so they could have different ways to be born and repent and repeat. Back to salt and black lace that squirms. And then um, this last piece uh, is actually the first piece I published with New River Press. So um, it's called She Sighs in Her Pantheon Drowning. She sighs in her pantheon drowning. For me, this difficulty is a muse forth. For me, this burning haze is a relief of stone. I keep you fairly close to my arms. I am thinking of a different word than arms. I am dreaming of your lost horns, a donation to me. Your glass ending is living, the objects you made are breathing. What a pleasure never to be captured. Uh, I'm from the Republic of Ireland, uh, but I live in the United Kingdom. Uh, where as of yesterday, all of the democratically elected members of parliament were told to shh by a hereditary monarch. 
So it's very good to be here in the Fifth Republic. <laughs> From uh, Robert Montgomery's edition of International Times. From Babylon, a neoliberal theodicy, a modern adaption of the 1000 BC Babylonian poem by Sagil Kinam Ubib. One, Erset Latari. The ideological parents are dead. The ideological parents are stored in money vaults. No professors, no commentators change anything, do they? Illiquidity reigns. The orphans of neoliberalism, children who cannot understand what mathematics, mathematicians do to them, cry privatizedly from the Switzerland of no return, sequestered in Babylon. To Huber. Clay proletariat, the dark visage scowls at light. Clay precariat, fallen or pushed to compete, are not all leveraged, all cross the Thames, Hudson. The rich swim death. Pray save to the goddess Randa. Pray save to the god Hayaku, to gods of Babylon. 16. Asru. Clay employees of gods humble the heads on walls, bow low to DSK, to Lagarde. Humble the heads in windows, bow low to Hollande. Humble the heads on screens, bow low to Le Pen, to Elise. Clay temps humble the heads on scaffolds in baskets bow low to lions of Babylon. 17. Sari. The crown prince is clothed in televisions, is clothed in newspapers. He waves to thousands who'll never know him, a white-gloved claw. The crown prince is clothed in hawks, is clothed in harriers, hovering in adverse loops. His duchy swoops on Babylon. <clears throat> in the realm of the isms, Isms one. The isms, stored in their vials like biological weapons, await release above metropolises, below masts, to fly from gut to gut. They have colour codes and symbols. Nihilism, white. Socialism, red. Zionism, blue. Anarchism, black, etc. Each chasing its own philosopher's stone. The isms are fountains, jetting from the lips of public intellectuals, sullied springs, mixed with human spit and bile, envenoming the very food banks for thought they draw on. Isms awake masses to gold-plated dawns of their choice. Isms with flags, Isms with slogans, or even comics to make them rubber-faced, funny. Isms are medieval, no one knows if they're real. Globalism displaces and replaces as if by algorithm. Conservatism culls foxes. Mithraism culls bulls. Isms never stop working. Isms too. Isms are as orbs. The grey moon in the ether is like an Englishwoman. Glass visible, moving the grey seas with a magnet will. Thatcherism seeking her guerdon ever, while Blairism, blue-suited and male, orbits in her wake. As children, the two insert coins into penny arcades, monetarism, militarism, Newton defying, the sterling is stacked, teetering over the abyss, image of trickle-down. But the bonanza never falls from machine to human hands. Thatcherism, a grey ghoul, sometimes manifesting in forms of statues, much unloved. Vandal prone, fenced off. Whenever she waxes, the mare returns, glowing sinister. The grey seas charge again, and the people go under into the material realm of water, suspended upside down, as the blue man follows behind her, untethering hawks, hiding his gold in his mouth. Isms three. In Marxism, the Victorian economy strips empress without clothing, gargantuan housefrau, wart arsed, a millennium of boors squatting under her hunkers, consuming pints of hobgoblin, pouches of old Holborn. 
Its three-volume Bible is more guidebook to etiquette than revolution, all alienating. The toad and the whole area at croaking of things to come, male vocal sacs ballooning to outdo the other in imitation of their meister. The ism chips them. This cargo cult covets materials, reservoirs of ire, replenish the fire buckets and axes they parade with daily, curmudgeonly homicides in progress, plotting how to divvy the queenly assets, then spilling from wasps' nests into jam jar palaces, drilled to gouge, coop and recoup. Isms 4. It was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. Melville. Nihilism, the nothing, the nothingness, the nihil, the no of England's whiteness at the no-go zone of Dover and in the blonde hair of the hologram at number 10 who should unscrew the one from his door forthwith. There he spouts, dick-like, beyond the black gloss, whiteness, the whale, the albatross, the shark, the polar bear and endless ice plains of nada. The white animals are in their white bestiary and the white lion lazes on a meaningless throne. They've already issued no's to the Europe they imported their nihilism from, and whitewash social media with empty bites, snide snarls. The white lion whitens, the fat cat fattens, as the will to power is chopping blocked, graceful in a Charles I way, but separating black blood thick as tar on Whitehall marble. Note, the author is an individualist anarchist come left-wing nationalist come democratic federalist and thus unenamored of the hierarchical, violent, authoritarian and centralised Marxist ideal. He also regards the term proletariat as unfit for purpose, preferring the more up-to-date precariat. <laughs> I, uh, I did place a copy of my book on the shelf to read from, but it's, it's vanished. So I'll try and do a poem from memory. Uh, it's a book called Firing Slits, Jerusalem Cold Portage. I wrote it in Jerusalem. Uh, this is a mystical hymn that came to me <coughs> on... Oh, thank you. That's really kind. It came to me... I wrote it on Mount Zion. Um, Zion. Zion designed and signed. Zion signed and resigned. The hill of the lower city loses his foothold, loses its grip. The mountaineer is unmountained. Zion the zealot guards, Zion the Protestant compost. Zion gate locked in, locked out of the tomb-rich, psalm-rich false-scarps. Zion, Sion, Sion. The name falls, the name falls from grace, falls from the trees, falls from the garden. The name falls from the rock of Eden into the dust of Hinnom. And finally, um, when we were here in 2016, it was, an, it was unforgettable because it was the very night that Trump was elected. Uh -huh. So we did the reading and had dinner. Julie and I ended up in the American bar watching the results come in. Uh, at two o'clock in the morning, it looked like Hillary was going to win, but we woke up in the morning, heard the news, and we headed straight for Notre Dame. It felt like a sanctuary. This poem then is a response to the burning of Notre Dame. Swimming in ash for Julie. Today it's Eleusinian spring, but I'm swimming in ash. Materialists are putting out the fire of Notre Dame with tears in mourning for craftsmanship, the making of gargoyles, the statue of Joan burning, a witch once again. The spire is hurled as a great javelin into the core of the forge. A missile shooting to dis, surely, to land in a mound of smoking carbons. A swimming pool of ashes for the philosophers of France. I am swimming with them too, not crying for rib vaults or flying buttresses or for rose windows made of glass only. I saw infant hoods Eden, charring and blackening again. My body a stake overdone, my eyes yellow roses of Aegon. Thank you. Hi guys. 
Uh, I'm Robert. Hello. Um, well done to Brit for a great reading and Niall and Heathcote for great readings. It's really nice to have you, Brit, all the way from America. It feels very glamorous to have an American poet with us tonight. <laughs> um, I'm going to read some poems that are not really book poems. They're billboard poems. And it's from a series called Words in the City at Night, which I started in 2004 and continues. And the idea is that I did a poem over a billboard at night and you find it in the night of the city and you think it might be, we well, don't know what it is. It's probably not an ad, although it's on a billboard. It could be the rantings of a madman. It most potentially is the rantings of a madman. I'm going to read them just randomly. I haven't chosen which ones. When we are sleeping, aeroplanes carry memories of the horrors we have given our silent consent to into the night sky of our cities and leave them there to gather like clouds and condense into our dreams before morning. People scattered like rain across the landscape of America are so separate from each other and lost. They will turn to anything they can recognize for solace, like fast food drive-ins with their lights lit up so pretty in the night sky, or movie stars, or war. This is the best way we have found to live. And we make everyone in this world of new privilege slaves to false ideas of God and comfort. And waking up every day is a wrench from the dream state into the paranoid new mind and we are still sad and lonely in a world of glass. Now all sense of good things has gone from your mind and all you can think of is the sky empty like a huge TV screen. The TV makes you feel sick like too many chocolates and now the sky disappoints you because it has less action. All you have left as a facsimile of transcendence is champagne and cocaine, tanning beds and sleeping pills. There is no changing of the seasons in the electric city and no real darkness. The street is illuminated all night with orange light and the concrete is like a carpet. We have dreamed the street as a room and it has become true. There is no indoors or outdoors anymore. In summer, we go to lie together beside the water. All of the things of the city mean half as much when we finally take them inside ourselves. The slow water lapping the sun on our skin and the shadows we cast echo for ages. Dogs also are happy lying like this, huddled together on the beach in and out of sleep with ancientness hovering over like a protected hand protective hand. The trees are arranged in vague semicircles. Halfway through the day you look up and there they are again, those aluminium verticals and their rhythm against the weak sky. How will you get through to lunch with the internet telling you the same thing every five minutes? Things that stay real, you say, are all you really want now. And you think you would protect those things if you could find them and carry them cupped in your hands gently like a shivering bird. The spectacle of advertising creates images of false beauty so suave and so impossible to attain that you will hurt inside and never even know where the hurt comes from. And in all the pictures now, the famous people have already begun to look lost and lonely. The flood will lift the ghosts from the Hollywood Lawn Cemetery and they will disappear like ether in the new dead air. All the names will be erased from the billboards and the theatres and the piers and the magazines and the monuments. You live by myths of immortality and your myths are not safe. I close my eyes and think of all the things I don't want. 
and I visualize them rolling by vacuum cleaners, 3D TVs, new phones and cars and handbags, a neat house in the suburbs. I think of how unhappy these things would make me, and then I am free. If you don't want these things, they can never truly take you. Then I think of wood, and I think of my bones as wood, something slow and put here a long time ago. One last poem. Which one? <laughs> that was a poem in itself. <laughs> I didn't decide. I can't find the William Blake poem now. It's like it's not in this book. Is it? He's lost. It's not in the magazine, is it? I don't think so. It will have to be this. New countries will grow up on graceful promontories where a few people gather together and in their world it will be illegal to own the land and they will make new literatures in which the oil age will be forgotten and our cities will be folded back into the sand and our words will be forgotten and they will not even remember how we once held the whole world in our hands and how we crushed it like a bird in our hands. Hello. Um, I just want to thank um, Sylvia and Adam and the Shakespeare and Company for having all of us. It always feels like... Um, just such a special thing to be here. Um, I've been coming here for many years, um, just as a as a reader and a, as a book lover. Um, so yeah, and I just want to thank all the poets who performed. I mean, I could sit there and just yeah, happily watch. Um, I'm going to be reading poems from my first translated collection of poetry, which is half in English and translated into Spanish. Um, but I won't be reading anything in Spanish because we'll be here all night. Um, I'm also going to read from the page. I'm quite blind. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Church of the Here Now. And um, it's a poem I wrote to Ginsberg on his birthday. Um, it's not a religious poem. Um, church is kind of the church in the everyday, the church in the mundane, the kind of the sacred in the everyday. Um, Church of the Here Now. Church the heart, church the knees, church the rosy cheeks, church the head kissed lands, church the numbness, church the blizzard soot dodo, church the burning sun patience, church the womb shelter, church to becoming better, to becoming overcome, to letting go, to giving up, to the every single connected day of sunlight. Church to suffering on insurance and then surrendering. Church the tree blunder. Church the broken sleep. Church the suburban queens with nails as long as roads and crown chamber mind alarms recording the sky like a library record. Not war, not war. Just the road, just the breath, just the mountain. Church on the cloud of death saddle, church for sale, church of the moving sky, the blackness, the moving sky, the people, the moving sky and the blackness, the church sleeping a family of fathers singing, hope love me to ashes, 
church the rooster foot amazement, church the painkillers, church the holy world antique disposition, church the church exits, church the crashing fear gone, Lorca the church, Robert the church, Hathcock the church, Brit the church, Mother the church, How the church, How the directory of the ripped balletic hearts on paranoid wind pools, Stranger the church in absolute moonshine buttonholes, Church the eggs inside the drifting pavement tree roar, Church the beautiful, the broken, the steeped, the parade, the enormity, the wall, the church of the eclipsed love sublime and terrified and kind and here, the church of here and now. Next poem I'm going to read is called, is a poem I wrote on the day I found out that Lennon Cohen died and um, I just woke up with lots of poetry everywhere and I was thinking what's going on and then um, I realised it was because he died and it was people posting his lyrics. It's called Afterlight. We found out that Lennon Cohen, Leonard Cohen died this morning and the world was reminded of poetry. The pale domes of white light or singing far away from where you sleep. Flame shadowing gods everywhere down the Tottenham Court Road, trapped up in tree light, lost in the light of the kitchen. You hold on to me and say, where do they go, the torpedoing shadows that fill the world, where the moon tries to draw closer and touch love, but doesn't quite make it through the fog? And how death could be the only way to reunite and return to music and find a different kind of peace, Again, how the angels must have known already without the intent of prayers. The long, long afterlight stored up in the day, shattering the, the harshness of the blank world. But still it rains at home. And like you, poetry still haunts everyone. Like the way we brought our baby home from hospital, all blue and breathed up, covered in traffic a swaying heaven ship. The new air of our flat is gentle, a cradle of ships all resting, making the afterlight command a nameless world, all static and in us. We all forgot to be homesick, unhurt by the thought of paradise. Rowing forward to a wall, a world full of beckoning wishes, like a winter of broken up keys. Forward to a graceful whisperer, making us mad again and holy again, like the commonness of a table face, nursing like a bed next to a chair. Forward again to the unseen notion of shores, playing hell violins, chaining loss, but really moving us closer to our own need of love. Love that is unwarred for, safer in the sky, closer to the birds who know your dreams like lullabies, filled with the downslow to pressed hands. I've woken up, I've woken in a window and existed from both sides. The morning is a train and the afterlight is a horse, travelling back to you, arms wide open, growing in a cupboard, a hyacinth stretching out to the first daylight. The next poem I'm going to read is one called Seven Sisters and it's the one I wrote with Robert Montgomery and it's a poem we read together because we wrote it together and he didn't want to read it tonight but I think we should okay. we should do it. <laughs> Come on. I'm filming the audience. Oh, the audience. Okay, okay. okay. Hold. okay. Well, yes. okay. Right. Okay. It's called Seven Sisters. You are beside me, winter trees, a comrade to the world, a home. The TV is playing war. We hope for peaceful sunlight. The children are dressed in black. 
They are throwing petrol bombs at the embassies, throwing electric flowers into the graveyards of capitalism. The philosopher is counting the slow candles of the icebergs, noting how many summers we have left. She is brilliant in her sunlight hat. Her chest is a pyramid. The president has retreated to the golf club. He rules in half sentences, coughing up the 1950s. His mind is a puddle where broken dreams sit on the rooftops of abandoned libraries. New weddings and empty churches. The minarets talk to the dawn before the sun lights up the city. The priests are whirling like dervishes in circles. They pinball off the walls, singing silence. Diane and the swan ride an open-topped red London bus. The trumpets beside them play rave music. LSD trips to the sound of brass bands, CCTV diamonds for oyster cards. God is bored of us now. God is bored of us now. She sides with the animals and the weather. And they watch our digital alien rampage with cool, sad eyes. <laughs> <laughs> We never quite know who reads what, but <laughs> we just know we wrote it together. Um, okay, the next poem I'm going to read is a poem. Um, it's called Tomorrow's Woman, and it's a poem of my next collection, which um, is out in February next year. Tomorrow's Woman has seen war in heaven. She is the blue of light before time draws. She has watched the women she loves in a throat, sorry, she has loved all the women she has heard in a throat hood behind an eye inhaling rain. Above the stars that cannot be filmed, stars that are not known for paradise, known for their isolations, biographers of pain, too full of memory. Tomorrow's woman is the color of night. Tomorrow's woman is his child. Tomorrow's woman is shelter. She is sex, the last shock against death. Sex, the last peace. Sex that forgets black and white. She is the first to hold a bird in her hands and learn of foreign love and not melt at the idea of difference. Tomorrow's woman is too fat. She bleeds because she knows what it is to fill a whole generation on her hips and still be seen as empty. A dog, a fiction, a miracle danger, an ocean of plastic, a soft dangle vine nothing, a war child. Face on a stand, eyes too close together, mouth like a rental car, feet crossed, the oven is on. Tomorrow's woman is your father and his mother and his mother and his mother. She is undammable, a renaissance of marching women, as strong as morning, as fearless as water, a school in wind lightning, hands like stolen trees, stuck up in fog, a library card to Jerusalem, only human in waves, a courtyard of scarlet fire, closed so far down into itself. It's hard to imagine what kind of God could believe the Dead Sea was female. It's hard to imagine what kind of God could believe that you could float on your back like this, not drowning. I'm going to read three more poems. Um, the next one's called Black Under Heaven, which I actually wrote here the last time we were here. So I just remembered it. Everything lives unnerved. Everything lives unnerved. Tiny cups and scissors hung over. Lilies in heaven marching in glass on the table. Our child arranging the sky, sleeping between the doorway. Blue garments and ocean on the bedroom floor. Your scent, a kind of black under heaven, all raging and soft, breaking the tracks of summer. A chapel in the fourth wall, always lit up and nursing. I have become larger in it, a new kind of warm ash, burning up the edges and bathing out the reality TV government. I've become more winged. 
We barely notice the ceiling falling onto our bed, emptying out the aerial stars that have tracked our whole lives till now, walked with us through hysteria and trees made into empty news. We live in one room, the BT Tower, our lighthouse. We have become two mothers. We are unearthed, dozing in the scent that is an eternal morning. Next poem is called Years. And you find the queen bee dried up, love edged, pill box sick, still humming the angel of the north, a yellow dress, once a gift, but now a lake with no time. Softly spoken, the stars have all been claimed, grief wheels stadiums descending in backwards hurries, temporary eyes unbranched, they touch each other with their moods, clutching a cooler bag of sky held like a co coffin, unable to keep a flush, dayless lowlands, unable to stop loving truly, emptying gateways, blurred world delights, unsighted, legs unshaven, and gasping and gasping, you fall asleep, but don't die. And then the final poem I'm going to read is one, it's called In the Morning Penelope, and it was commissioned by the National Poetry Library. Um, they, and I was asked to kind of think, write something about on an odyssey. And for me, I'm always fascinated about the journey of light. Um, and this is the journey of light to morning. The first together is the morning itself. The marrying wish of dew, the first dance of the grass renewed like a child's clock. The grass sings to the window, come down to the sky fields, come down and re-watch the calypse, come down Penelope. The early light, unaware of the low hum that entwines the mood of the air, strangely worshipping in high memory cries. And we remember the ghost better in the morning, the rising light that is always a grace on the backs of the things you love, scattered through the house like Lego. The bed remains ancient in its ritual of worship, a personal attack against strangers made up of all of its own Trojan walls, hung in literature undebated. It is easy to believe that it is a privilege to grow old in the morning and that age is young and that all that is above will remain immortal, regardless of loneliness. Thank you. Sorry, I'm very lazy, so I have to sit down. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, just if you can just make some water soon. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So it's quite amazing. I um I got this guitar a few months ago in an auction in the UK. And this is the first acoustic gig I've played since then. And it was made in Paris in like 19, no, 1887. Wow. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and now it's here. It's pretty mad. Um, I, so this first song I'm gonna play is called Gaping. And it's kind of about sort of the destructiveness of empty space, like sort of withholding information or loss, or like pessimism, <laughs> just like, just the destructiveness of emptiness. <laughs> Pulling anchor of me 
description this time. <laughs> Too little time in a health. 
healthy family environment When I first saw him I wait out patiently watching cause darling only I knew we'd be falling just to feel young would be nice while in the early stages of fine Dragging our old habits to die In the public square we'll cry In the public square we'll cry Oh some backing vocals from over there. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can join him if you want. Um, yeah, this song is normally kind of played with another uh, other stuff going on, but I'm going to try and do it just guitar. I think it will work. The backing vocals will thicken it up. I'm counting on you. <laughs> Actually, have this here ready. Take up all their time Take up all their time Take up all their time they don't mind Come 
Thank you so much for coming, everyone. I believe that opens till nine. There we have these wonderful books uh, here for sale and some wine. And I hope you'll stick around and drink and talk with us. And uh, please put your hands together one more time for all of these wonderful poets. And, you know, follow us on Instagram, sign up to our mailing list, all of that, and let's have a drink.